Okay, what we're going to cover is the next topic, which is shear stresses. And we have covered normal stresses, sigma. Well, we covered normal stresses are sigma. Shear stresses, we're going to use the symbol tau. And like we said, sigma is normal stresses. So what do I mean by normal? Well, we have our beam here. There's our beam, and then we created our stress distribution that looked something like this. And notice that um, here is my plane, and these stresses are normal to that plane at 90 degrees. So that's where we get the word normal stresses for the sigma. The tau are parallel stresses, so in other words, parallel to the surface, and um, we call those shear stresses, and I'll explain what I mean by parallel and to what surface they are parallel. So. Um, just a review with sigma. Sigma is what? Well, we are familiar with our stress strain curve, sigma epsilon, that you developed in your materials class. And that stress strain curve, if you remember, looked something like this, um, whereby, you know, it's linear and then it's somewhat flat afterward. And the slope of the linear portion was um, E, the Young's modulus. And that was normal stress, normal strain. You may not have defined it and called it that, but that's what they are. And in other words, normal strain, how was that defined? Well, we started out with a, a specimen that looked this, that size, and then what happened was it got longer, and that length increase was delta. The original length is L, and the normal strain was defined as delta over L. And that epsilon... So don't, don't call this E. That is epsilon. This is E. So don't mix those two symbols up. So sigma, epsilon, normal stress, normal strain curve looked like that based on this uniaxial tension test. Now, what we end up with is we have, so like I say, this is normal stress, normal strain, well, there is also shear stress and shear strain, and the slope of that linear portion is G, the shear modulus. So, very similar behavior. Now, how do we do this shear stress, shear strain? How do we measure that? Well, we start with a square, for instance. <laughs> we could do this in the lab. And then we apply this shear stress tau. Now notice this shear stress is parallel to this surface and that's why it's the shear stress. It's parallel. When in contrast, here's our sigma. It is perpendicular to that surface. So um, once again I want to emphasize the difference between tau and sigma. Now the Gamma also is shear strain. It's not epsilon. Epsilon is normal strain. So shear strain, how is that defined? Well, interestingly, interestingly enough, it's also defined as delta over L. Same with normal strain, except that the delta and the L are defined differently. So if I apply my shear stress, it turns that square into a parallelogram and we define the delta as the amount that this has gone over and the um, 
L is, is the original height. So, again, it's delta over L. Strain, no, shear strain, is delta over L, but the delta and the L are defined differently. So, we are talking about shear stresses, and um, let's look and see how they are generated in a beam due to bending. So, this is what we're interested in. Now, shear stresses, of course, can, can occur in many different ways, but we are considering beam bending and what are the shear stresses in beam bending. So, um, so we're looking at shear stresses in beams. I want you to consider basically a, a laminated beam where uh, the laminations in this particular case are not fixed together so that it's like the pages of a book. So if you take the pages of a book or take a <laughs> yeah, take the pages of a book or a stack of papers and you treat them like a beam and bend them, this is what's going to happen. So this is the original shape of the beam and when the beam bends we're going to get this sort of behavior here where uh, the the laminations slide over one another and like I say if this is a stack of paper take a stack of paper bend it you're going to see sliding at the two edges there and um, what's happening and, and you can see this that uh, if I take a look at the the first top two laminations in other words these two there then what's happening is and I'm looking at this these edges here you can see clearly that there's sliding that's taking place in this region so that when sliding takes place that you know, generates friction basically and that generates friction is generates stresses parallel to the plane that's what friction does so if I look at so look at point B there's point B point A there's point A and what I see is that when the sliding takes place if I'm looking at this top lamination here, then I'm getting the sliding is producing producing this direction tau, a shear stress there. And on the other side at A, I'm getting sliding producing that stress there, a tau. Now, I don't know what that tau is. My goal is going to be to figure out what that tau is. Our, our goal is to write an equation for tau. And, and um, that's what I'm going to derive here. So it's going to be, I'm just going to let you know what's coming up. You know, remember that we, we created sigma is equal to minus my over i. And so, you know, we'll sort of write it in this way. It's minus something, something over something. <laughs> and it's fill in the blanks, basically. Now, I'm going to tell you what we're going to get for tau, we're going, to, we're going to get tau is equal to something, something over something, something. So it's going to be similar. The derivation is obviously different, but I'll guide you through that. So this is the derivation. So suppose I have the, so here's my beam right there. And uh, this is simple. I've got, you know, P there. Um, supports there. And my shear diagram would look like that. That means my moment diagram would look like that. And my what I want to do is I want to take a free body diagram of this region between A and B here. And so if I look at this, I want to look and I want to look at what my bending moment diagram shows at those two points. And what do I see? I see that the moment at B is greater than the moment at A. And I'm separating these by a distance of delta x, so it's small. But, but no matter, the moment at B is greater than the moment at A. So we're going to pursue this derivation with that. 
So if I make, so I'm making this cut here, and here's my free body diagram of that. And I know that the stresses, the normal stresses, sigma, are going to be distributed on that plane like this. And I know that they're greater at B than at A because the moment at B is greater than the moment at A. So um, I'm getting bigger stresses on this side than this side. They're bigger on this side than this side. So, um, all right, next we're going to, now we're going to take the free body diagram a little bit farther. I'm going to take a free body diagram of just this little, this is little portion here at the top, so just the top lamination. And um, let's look at that free body diagram. So um, this is the top lamination here. That's A, that's B. And I'm looking at these stresses, so the stresses are bigger at B than A. And of course, I just have a portion of the uh, portion of the stresses because they're um, because the you know what am I showing there? So I am showing this region those stresses right there. So they are trapezoids. You know this this portion of the stress is a trapezoid, and it looks like this. There's one trapezoid. There's the other trapezoid. So. Um, I'm going to call this point C, G, D, H, all right? So we're going to draw this in, in three dimensions. But let's look at what, what I have here so far. Now, if I just have this stress and this stress, what do I see? I see that the stress on the right is greater than the stress on the left. And if I convert those into forces, I'm going to see that the force on the right is bigger than the force on the left. Well, that can't be because this has uh, got to be an equilibrium. And so I need a force underneath here, or stress, I'm showing you the stress, going to the right to keep it in equilibrium. So in other words, this, I'm talking in forces here, I'm in generically, the force caused by, so the force caused by this plus the force caused by this has got to be equal to the force caused by this because it's got to be in equilibrium. The other way to look at this is that the force caused by this has got to be the force caused by this minus the force caused by that. So we know, we know this, we can create a force for that because we know it, we've been working with it. We know this one, again, because we know that and we've been working with it. So I can figure out these two and that means I can get that one by subtraction. So that's my goal. And, um, what I'm going to do is take a 3D image of the free body diagram uh, because I have to convert the stresses to forces. So whenever we do equilibrium, it's always with forces, not stresses. So we always have to convert our stresses to forces. So let's do the 3D picture. So like I say, C, G, D, H. And where do those occur on my 3D picture? Here is my 3D picture here. And there is C, D, G, H. In other words, um, this purple region here is this purple region here. So those two purple regions are, they're the same. Now, um, Let's put some dimensions on this. So the when I, but when I, I draw the fr 3D image of this top lamination, and what do I see? Here's my width B here. So this is my the width of my my beam, and uh, and this distance here is delta x. 
So that's the delta x right there. So I haven't drawn it perfectly, but that's, that's the idea. So in other words, this side over here is my a side. That side over there is my b side. Okay, so what's a 3D picture of, I need to draw these stresses in 3D, it's a little more difficult, but that looks like that in 3D. And that looks like that in 3D. So, I want to get the volume of that stress block is the force, the volume of that stress block is the force. So that's what I'm going to um, do, and then all I have to do is, <laughs> um, is take this force minus that force and that's going to give me the information I want about the stress that goes underneath there which I haven't really shown that tau goes underneath there that we can't quite see so okay so hopefully everybody has the picture of what I've drawn here and um, I'm gonna call this the shaded area here <laughs> this little area that I'm shading I'll refer to this thing called the shaded area so that we all know what I'm referring to. I'm referring to this little area here, okay, when I talk about the shaded area. So, okay, so basically to find my tau, I'm simply going to, going to take the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero. So we might, must convert the stresses to forces. So how do I do that? Well, the force on, se on section A is, is what? Stress times area, in a sense, sigma dA, that's stress times area is force. But, you know, since the stress is not constant, notice that so the stress varies here on both sides. It's not constant, so I can't just take stress times area. I have to take the integral of sigma dA is how I do that. So, and then the force on B is, you know, force on B is what? It's again, it's the integral of sigma dA also. And basically we have a CDE up here, an FGHJ there. What do I mean by that? So I'm looking at these letters there's a c d e so that's that area that cross-sectional area basically and then we have f g h j that's that cross-sectional area so and we'll notice that you know basically yeah, the areas are equal in other words since we have a what's called a prismatic beam we have that a, the area ACDE is equal to the area FGHJ. We'll note that. Okay, so let's proceed with this and start filling in what we know. Well, I know that sigma is what? Minus MY over I, minus MY over I. So, um, you know, this is minus MA, Y over I, minus MB, Y over I. And, um, I can pull out the constants. So I take m over i, pull it out. That's at b, and then I take, or sorry, a, and this is b, this one's b, minus mb over i. And so now I have the integral of y dA. Well, um, again, we're going to use a symbol for the integral of y dA. I'm going to call it q, which is, always, which is also called an area moment. You can sort of see the, why that's called an area moment. It's an area times a distance. So people call it an area moment, but I'm just going to call it Q. Um, again, it's one of these properties like moment of inertia. It is, that is just a definition. Don't think about it too much. We will, I mean, you have to calculate it and you have to know how to get it but, um, you know, don't think about it conceptually. It's just a, a definition. So, okay, so what we end up with is my FA is minus MAQ over I, and FB is minus MBQ over I. So the force at A, force at B, those are 
Okay, so what I end up with, so now I have my C, D, G, H, so I'm looking at this. This comes down to here, and now it's in forces, so instead of stresses, so that I have my F, B here, I have my F, A there, and then I have... I'm calling it a force, a T, so I've drawn everything in forces. Here, up here is in stresses, the other is in forces. So what do I know? I can see that T is going to be FB minus FA, capital T. And that T is the force due to the shear stresses. So The T, again, is going to stress times area is force. Well, what area are we talking about? That's probably, notice that this force T, it acts, you know, at the bottom underneath here. <laughs> I can't quite show it perfectly, but it goes underneath this thing. So what area does that stress or force act on? Well, it acts on the bottom the bottom of this thing. Well, the bottom of that thing is what? Well, that's letters D, E, H, J. So that's the area that that stress acts on, that force. So stress times the area, well, what's the area? The area is D, E, H, J, that area. So my my um, so I my uh, T is tau times a, and we have to get the right a. So my T is the difference between the two forces, and. Um, so it's force B minus force A. I have to use, uh, use the um, signs properly. And so this becomes what? Well, it's minus a minus, so it's plus. So I end up with MA minus MB times Q over I. And... You know, MA minus MB is what? Well, it's, I can write that as a delta M. Difference in moments. So my T is what? Tau times A. And the area is DEHJ. So tau times A is going to be delta M times Q over I. Well, what is my area, A? What is that A? Well, I'm going to look back at my figure, and I see that this under area is what? Well, it's B times the delta X. It's, you know, it's that rectangle underneath there. So I can replace the area of um, DEHJ with B delta X. Then I manipulate this equation and I get um, tau is equal to delta m over delta x times q over ib. I'm gonna, going to take that to the limit, and I'm write it as dm dx uh, times q over ib, but what do I know about dm dx? dm dx is what? The slope of the moment diagram. Well, what's the slope of the moment diagram? The slope of the moment diagram is the shear, v. So I end up with my expression that tau is equal to VQ over IB. And I want you to memorize that expression. And what is each term? Well, tau is the shear stress at our point of interest. Now, where was our point of interest here? Let's look where our point of interest was. Notice our point of interest is down, we're, 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 in other words, we're solving for the tau down here underneath that. So if I'm showing my point of interest, my point of interest on the beam cross-section is going to be there. So in other words, let's go back. Where am I finding my 
I guess I haven't shown the um, the beam cross section, but no matter what, what I'm looking at is I'm looking at my my point of interest is here at that depth there because we just below the top lamination in this particular case. So if I were to show the um, the beam cross section, well, this is a laminated beam, so here's my beam cross section um, where this is you know this is B and this is H and what I've done there's my point of interest right there my point of interest is right there right below the bottom lamination which means that this sh this shaded area that I have emphasized here is that shaded area is you know, it's it's that shaded area is this area, this green that I'm writing here. So I, I say this because I want to make sure that when we're looking at the beam cross section, that you can see that the shaded area is just ab above the point of interest. So, uh, you know, shaded area is above the point of interest. So that's what I want you to recognize and what, what area are we talking about? What is this shaded area? Because that ends up to be important to us. So um, okay, so okay, so what we're looking at is that the Tau is the shear stress of the point of interest, which we just showed is just below the top lamination in this particular case. V is what? The shear force from the shear diagram, you know, at the point of interest. <laughs> That's easy to get. I is the moment of inertia, same as before. It's, <laughs> why? Because it's the same sigma is equal to minus my over I. It's that same moment of inertia. That's how we got there. So the moment of inertia is just the same as before. We've already gotten that. The, top, the V, the force, we've done the shear diagram, so we got that too. B is the smallest width of the beam at the point of interest because the, where does the B come from? The B comes from, the B comes from here, the width over which the shear stress acts. So that is our width of our beam cross section. And it's got to be the smallest one because that's, it's got to be in contact with the lower lamination. Q is the integral of y dA, and we're going to take it, no, not the best terminology, but remember we had d times a in our parallel axis theorem. 112 bh cubed plus d squared a. Or it, was d, it was d squared a there, and now it's d times a. Here, but it's the same D. Where D is measured from the overall centroid to the centroid of our area again. So it's the same thing as we've been doing, except that we've got to do this shaded area. Y is measured from the overall centroids. So that's how we always measured Y. Therefore, D, the way that we're doing it, this is not this D. That's a DA for a you know, for, for our integral, but that's, so I'm using this, this, this D is our D from our parallel axis theorem, basically. So in other words, what we're going to find, we're going to find is that a Q might be a D1A1 plus D2A2 for, for two areas. Uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time on Q. Why? Everything else is easy. These three things in, in our equation, that's these three things, those are easy. Everybody gets those pretty much. The only hard thing in this equation is the Q. So we're going to spend a good bit of time talking about the Q and how to get that. All right, I'm going to stop there.